Welcome to industrialscripts.co.uk, home of the Insider Interviews, a series of Q&As with people currently working at various levels and in different areas of the British film industry. The interviews are absolutely exclusive to Industrial Scripts and can't be accessed anywhere else. Okay, I think the sound level is good. Um, so, hi there, um, this is Danny Stack from the UK Scriptwriters Podcast. Uh, here I am with uh, Ben Wheatley, who's the writer and director of um, this year's smash British film, uh, Kill List. Hi, Ben. Hello. Uh, thanks for joining us um, this morning. Um, very good of you. No worries. So, um, if for those who haven't seen Kill List, we're probably going to talk about maybe mild or heavy spoilers, but one thing we will not do is talk about the ending. Okay. Uh, because <laughs> it's, it's one of those films, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it's been very difficult to talk about full stop, really. And um, it, it's interesting watching the poor PR lot trying to deal with it. Okay. And, and and very amusing watching them try, trying to review it. It always looks slightly suspicious when people say, "Oh, we can't possibly talk about the plot." But um, yeah, 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 it's good. I mean, it's good that that's happened. Uh, it's very rare to go and see a film that you don't know anything about anymore. I think. Well, yeah. Well, should I try and give it a pitch? Uh, I, um, yeah, go on then. I'll, I'll give you my version of the pitch, which hopefully isn't really spoiler or anything. I would say. Um, Two two hitmen or soldier or soldiers for hire uh, get a, a a job to uh, kill a few people on their uh, on a kill list, but it slowly descends into a into a personal and physical hell that nobody was expecting. Yeah, almost sounds like a crossword puzzle, doesn't it? Yeah, no, it, it's really <laughs> uh, a crypt crossword puzzle question. But it's it's a really it's a terrific film. It kind of. It either, I suppose it divides audiences, or it could divide audiences, It's because you just sit there and it kind of blows your mind. It starts off quite almost domestically, doesn't it, in a way, and it, with the kind of couple's argument at uh, preparing for dinner kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an odd one. It kind of divides audience into people who really demand explanation for everything from their filmed entertainment and people who don't and like to have a think about stuff and I think it because it you know it's a genre film so it starts to get into the territory of kind of pissing off various different groups of people so people that would be more open to that kind of filmmaking are not necessarily horror fans and people who are horror fans don't necessarily like things that are terribly ambiguous so it's it's difficult yeah well I'm really interested in the um Nitty gritty of of how everything came together with Kill List, especially kind of the idea. And I know you write with your um, um, wife, mm. uh, who's got the best media name I think in the country, uh, Amy Jump. Mm-hmm. Um, so that that'd be really interesting to find out um, how you work together. But before before we get to that, I'd like to rewind the clock a bit, I suppose, just to just to get a, a sense of uh, how you started really and how you kind of broke in, because I believe. You, did you start off with animation um, and and doing kind of virals and short films and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I I was um, I did a degree in fine fine sculpture, and um, uh, but as part of that degree, I, I um, got an opportunity to use edit equipment, and um, I really loved editing, so I started making short films and editing them myself. Um, and when I came out of uni, I was really hoping to get into that world, but it is quite difficult. So yeah, I was an edit assistant for a bit. Mm. Um, and then I kind of found myself uh, kicking around the house for a long time unemployed. So I started, you know, I was always writing stuff. So Amy and I were writing and writing and writing from the very beginning. So we did about 10 years worth of kind of writing novels and scripts and all sorts of stuff. But yeah. it, it kind of took a very long time to learn it, to learn how to write, you know, even vaguely sensibly. Um, and then I kind of ended up um, working in marketing, and I very accidentally I tricked in, tricked in, tricked in, tricked into it, yeah. cr- cruelly. And um, uh, I did a lot of. Um, I used to write radio um, quizzes and stuff, like that and, mm-hmm. and um, do radio promotions and stuff. And, that. and then they kind of slipped into advertising, so I ended up doing a writing copy for um, at the very early days of online uh, marketing in like, I suppose it's like 98, 99 or something like that. Right, okay. And, and did a lot of, and then through that did a lot of kind of online 
like little flash games and, and bits and bobs. And then the company we work, I worked for went bust. And I was on my ass, and I thought I was right, a highly skilled media professional, but found out that you know the whole sector had collapsed, and it was just doomed. Um, and I, I was totally unemployable, and ended up um, sitting at home and trying to retrain. Um, and while I was retraining, I started posting a lot of stuff on um, sites like um, B to B three TA dot com. Oh yeah, and. Um, kind of tangentially ended up getting quite a big audience to the website that I had rather than and the, the, the work I was trying to get which was trying to break into the games industry just didn't happen wow. um, but but at the same time we had this website and ended up being offered work in television and in um, advertising um, and so that my kind of nascent directing career kind of came out of that. Because you were just you were shooting your own kind of virals weren't you? I mean yeah I mean we did I made I used to make I used to sit at the computer and make kind of seven or eight things a day. Some of them were images, straight images, some of them sometimes comic strips, sometimes little GIF animation things. And then they kind of progressed into longer, longer-ish kind of flash animation. Um, and then as it, technology picked up, I started doing more um, live action stuff. Yeah, I think, I think there's one that you're particularly well known for, which is your cunning stunt viral. Yeah, Which, that one, one I did with Rob Hill, who's in Down Terrace, and yeah. he and he, we've been friends for years and years. He lives around the corner from me at that time, and we kind of just one up one morning. We just I've been thinking about it for a long time, the how to the, the technical ins and outs of how to do it. But then we we kind of went out and shot this little clip of him jumping over a car and then being and then giving the thumbs up and then being accidentally run over by another yeah. car. It's the perfect. Is it went, yeah, it went ballistic. It was like, you know, I mean, I'm still getting emails about it today, but I think at the time it, went, it was about 15 million views and it was it was before YouTube. So in those days, you you would, YouTube seems to have kind of owned, it weirdly owns all that kind of, that online space for video. But at the time, with no YouTube, it meant that people had to go to individual sites to see video clips. So you got this massive amount of traffic through your website if you you had a popular clip. Yeah. Um, and that was, yeah, that was very really instrumental in you and me getting other work. Well, it's it's the perfect viral for those listening. You should just do a quick Google on it. It's like nine seconds long, I think, and uh, it's just very visual and very funny, and it makes you kind of do a double, almost triple take, really. Uh, so it's high impact, perfect kind of viral stuff. Yeah, and I, and I did a lot of those, and I think I did a, after that, when I started working, I think I got about, I did about 100 or 150 odd different um, kind of commercial, either either ads for TV or uh, online viral stuff um, over a two year period, I just was working all the time, and that, that was basically um, developing my directing skills, I guess, and then uh, during the same time, I ended up directing a lot of kind of long form comedy on TV as well. That's right. So, so what kind of timeline are we thinking here? Early 2000s? Yeah, I guess it all started to kick off uh, it was about eight years ago, it started to kick off and it kind of built momentum after that. And would you say kind of the key to kind of getting that kind of work was just doing stuff off your own back and being as proactive as possible? Absolutely, and, yeah. I mean, that, we would have, we'd, we'd got, you know, we'd written, um, Amy and I had written a sitcom. We tried to break into sitcom kind of territory in about 1999, 2000, and we'd kind of got through to like the last round of one of the comedy labs on, on Channel 4. Um, oh, yeah. And then, but we just, I don't know, you look at that stuff and you realise that there's only two or three things commissioned a year if you're lucky. Yeah. And there's plenty of established writers who are going to pick all that stuff up. So it was kind of pointless. I mean, it was good discipline to actually sit down and write something like that. But we knew that we kind of start, as we investigated a bit further into um, into the world of TV writing, realised it's pretty much, it's pretty clothed. Um, and then we started, when once I got that... Um, when I did uh, Wrong Door, I got I've got some writing credits on that and on um, the BBC Three sketch show. Yeah, and also yeah. on um, Time Trump the Amanda Anucci yeah, um, comedy. But but again, you even if you wrote every minute of those shows, it's still not quite enough money to live. Yeah. So you find that a lot of these guys are all kind of straight out of Cambridge, and they're all um, I can only imagine that they've. 
other incomes. I can't, I can't see how you, you can't support a family on it, you know, or pay a mortgage on the money you would earn. And you'd have to be all over telly. You'd have to be writing everything before you could make a proper living out of it. Yeah. That was quite an eye opener. Yeah, that, <laughs> indeed. Well, I think the guys who get the commissions, the, the direct commissions get the money. And then when they're, especially with comedy, with, for sketches and, and, and shows like that, I think the writing is always very low. Yeah, it's a, it's a, a down, when I was doing it, it was done on a per minute basis of what was on television. So yeah. you'd, write, you'd write basically War and Peace, and then you'd get 30 seconds on, you get paid for that. And you're like, oh Christ, you know that's no way to live. Yeah. I mean, sometimes you get was it guaranteed minutes, don't you? So then, then that's a bit more like they they're throwing you a bone. Yeah. But if you're starting, it's tough. Um, but yeah, the stuff that, but I wouldn't have got anywhere if I hadn't have done, written stuff and made stuff basically off my own back. And that's where Down Terrace came from, which was the first feature that I did. Was was basically came out of doing a lot of TV. Um, comedy directing and then talking to my agent and going well I really want to do some drama and him saying well you can't because you've got to make a short film because they won't trust you to direct drama from um, just doing comedy yeah. and I couldn't understand that so I thought well there's I'm not I, I think that you know f short films are pretty much a waste of time so I thought I'd, if I'm going to make them, uh, uh, that much effort then I might as well make something that I can sell and um, make a feature yeah. and just, just do it quick so we, um, so that's how that came about, and then that was something I'd written as well with um, Rob Hill, um, and, uh, and I guess the trick with Down Terrace was is that, and it, and it seems like a bit of a, it, it it was quite a mental leap to do this, and I, I think when you explain it to people, people are a bit confused about it, but the idea of not writing anything, not writing any old thing, you've got what you've got to write is something that you can actually make. And it's got to be, you start with the pragmatic details of what you have available to you rather than letting your imagination go, run wild. Yeah. And it almost is counter to how everyone really talks about writing because what they normally talk about is like going, follow your dream and you've got, if you've got a story to tell, what is yeah. your story, you know? But that, but that is not going to help you get a film made. You've got to really think about what story you, you're able to tell, not exactly. what story you want to tell, you know? Yeah, so it matches the budget. And what yeah, you, which, you, which you, if you're doing it yourself, is nothing. Well, so. I was going to link into Down Terrace, but you did it for me very neatly. Thank you very much. Um, it, because I think most people would look at Kill List thinking, oh, what a debut. But it's, it's not, of course. Down Terrace was your first film, which you made, I think, in 2008 or 2009. Yeah. And that was, it was all set in one location, wasn't it? In, um, in the Pretty house. Chair, yeah, yeah. But it had a kind of a, a good idea in terms of the, a, you know, the leader of a crime family wants to on mass to snitch in who he thinks is in the, his midst kind of thing. Yeah, when you say it like that, it sounds pretty generic, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, no, but, but it's, it, it, it's, at least it's not like somebody coming home because somebody's died kind of thing, and they're all talking about their feelings. That's the other plot. Yeah, exactly. So, um, But I have it down here as an eight-day shoot. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. Oh, yeah. my God. Uh, so and it, friends it, and family, kick, bollocks, scramble, just get it done? Yeah, but it, you know... You can you can shoot. I've been on plenty of student shoots and and low budget shoots where it always feels everything like is like a massive compromise and it always looks a bit cheap and horrible. Mm. But I think the way you've got to think about these things is that you again as this pragmatism thing of, of going well, this isn't really a film. It's it's more of a it's in a documentary style and it's a documentary. So if you shoot a documentary, you wouldn't be surprised if you shot a feature length documentary in four days, really. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah. if you think of Primer, the one about uh, uh, Primary, the one about um, Kennedy, that the Maisels and uh, Pennebaker shot, that was shot in four days. So, wow. you know, perfectly acceptable to shoot a documentary in four days. No one, no one would um, think that was incredible. So, if you once you've changed your mindset into, into that and think what you're doing is you're capturing things in real time, as if you're filming like a play that's going on around you, yeah. then it suddenly isn't such a big deal, really. Um, and then you basically have to you get you have to let go of certain things. So you go right. Well, it's lit in the round. It's not. It's going to be a lot of available light. So you, there's no time for fiddling with lights and stuff. And once you've gotten over that, then things are much easier. Um, 
and then you play to your strengths, then it's all about performance, and it's not about not about lighting or not about shots. Um, and you can't you can't maraud about as a director being touchy about things. You just it's more about capturing those great performances rather than you know your you know inverted commas vision. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Well, I suppose what Down Terrace did was the value of ten short films, really. Because uh, you, you just said short films are a waste of time, and they kind of are when yeah. you do, when you do just kind of disposable ones. Um, but Down Terrace got you the industry kind of attention that I mean, I suppose is what you wanted, or is what we all want, I suppose, when we make films of that type. Yeah, I mean, it's not just it wasn't just a calling card; it was an actual movie. You know, it was yeah. a movie that was that was in the cinema and and had distribution in the UK and in the states and had a DVD release. It was a, it's a it's a real film. You know, it's kind of and in a way. You know, you say like 10 short films, but uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't even, uh, I think the route, I, I it's, per- it's a perfectly credible route to go down making shorts, but it's a long old game, you know. It's going to yeah. take you a long time to get anywhere with it. And, and raising the money for that first really pretty expensive short, it's going to take you ages. And I don't know why anyone trust you to do it, you know. Yeah. It's, you know, and then there's certainly no one would have ever funded Down Terrace, you know. Exactly. You, you've got to do things yourself to show people and then they reward you in kind if it's any good kind of thing. Yeah, well, it's, and it's a thing and it's a democratisation through technology, you know. We couldn't have made Down Terrace the year before. In 2008, that film couldn't have been made. Yeah. But in 2009, it, it, it could be made because of, um, you know, red the red camera was uh, readily available and it was cheap, you know. Yeah. Um, and it looked amazing. I mean, we did tests for Down Terrace, which were on um, camcorders, and it looked rotten. And that it would have been exactly the same performances and the same film, but it would have got nowhere because everyone would have looked at it and gone, oh, it's just, you know, we've seen this stuff before, this dog and stuff looks horrible. Yeah. Um, but it's just that, you know, that, that slight change in technology allowed us to make that movie. Brilliant, yeah. And so Steve Coogan and Baby Cow... It, you're kind of is linked in with Down Terrace, isn't it? And yeah, I mean, that, that. Look, it's a very light link. That I mean, it's because I was working with them doing Ideal. Yeah, that's what I was going to say because you yeah. just went on to direct Ideal, which yeah. would be good good TV money, I suppose, to keep you busy. Yeah, totally. Well, it, Ideal's more um, was more about getting experience with working with lots of actors and and blocking and kind of you know lots of camera camera movements and working in sets that's what attracted me to that and yeah. obviously it's a great script and they're all really really funny mm. but it but in terms of the the baby cow connection to down terrace it was because we didn't have any insurance right so we we went to them and said can you sort the insurance out for us and they did and it cost 200 quid fantastic <laughs> and that was that and and we thought basically you know that, that it's great to have their name associated with that with the movie, but that was their that was their entire input. And uh, I think Henry um, Normal read the script a few times and gave some notes back on it, which were really really helpful. That's great. Yeah. And, he, and he watched the, he watched one of the uh, one of the later cuts and gave some advice on that. But I mean, I think with Henry, the most uh, the the best thing I ever had from him was that was having him in the edits for Ideal and just watching how he works and how he looks at how to cut stuff and timing and that, that that kind of thing is invaluable to get close to people like that who've got masses of experience. Yeah, well, I mean, it, it sounds like like through everything leading up to Kill List, it was just kind of ideal experience and prep to go, okay, now I've got this idea and I've got, I, I think I really now have the nose to do it properly. I mean, how, I mean, if getting to Kill List properly now, how did it, even the idea come about just to kind of, was it bubbling away, or was it just like, okay, let's do our next feature? Well, again, it's um, it, it's pragmatism. Again, it's like there's not, it's not a big budget film. Kill this by any respect. It's not even. I don't think it even qualifies as low budget. It, you know, it's still. I think it was half a million pounds on screen. Um, a three week shoot. It's quite quick again. Wow. So there, there's a lot of elements of that that have to be toned back. So. You know, on, on one side, it's, it's like it looks like kind of, you know, you do a, a whole act in the house, um, which is, you know, some reviews say was quite daring for a for a horror film that's got action in it. But then it's you know, got to you you have to have a certain amount of that kind of material because you can't afford to do anything else. You know what I mean? So that that that's one side of it. One one thing that 
And the same thing with Down Terrace was that we, that I like to start from the idea of um, actors I want to work with, and then I write the s- scripts initially for them. So, um, Kill List had come from working with Neil Maskell and Michael Smiley and Yana Buring and Emma Fryer um, before, and kind of going, right, what, what would it look like together in a movie? And then trying to work, write characters that would fit their kind of characteristics a bit. Yeah, well, I mean, and the, but you sat down with Amy to do it. Uh, was this the first time you'd kind of uh, written with Amy for a while, or was she always involved with the stuff that you were Yeah, doing? no, she'd always been, she, she wrote bits on um, on Down Terrace, um, and she edit, and Amy and I edited with Rob on Down Terrace as well. Yeah. Um, and uh, basically the way our working practice on Kill List it was that I would, I'd come up with like high concept stuff and then I write the first drafts so I, I'm, I'm like a kind of page filler yeah so I'll do all that stuff and then Ames will do will come in and look at the script and kind of go well this doesn't work and that doesn't work and and she'll do like um, a lot of characterization stuff and theme thematic bits and then she'll kind of boil it all down as well so um so my more meandering script will become tighter through her work on it. Yeah. Um, and then, because she's edits as well, so the final part of our script writing process is in the edit suite. Mm. So there's another pass there where we where we boil it right now. Sorry, that's the phone. One sec. <laughs> Probably someone trying to sh- tell me insurance as usual. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, uh, um, but at so, this stage, Warp X uh, had come on board, or did they kind of, or did you have to pitch it to them, or? How well, yeah, they... we basically after we'd done Down Terrace, we kind of thought that there would be an opportunity to make another movie. So, um, while we were doing the post, we kind of, I sat down and wrote treatments for other films. I wanted a slate of movies that were at different budget levels in case, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen. So it might have been that Dan Terrace went really massive. Then people would be coming to you and saying, well, what do you want to do next, you know? Yeah. Okay, sorry about that interruption. My internet crashed, reliable BT there. So um, where were we? You were, um, we were talking about Kill List. Yes, and um, how it came about—that was it. Yeah, Warp got involved. Yeah, so basically, yeah, we'd written um, I'd written a load of treatments for stuff after Down Terrace at different budget levels in the state. You know, uh, people came along with a massive bag of money, and um, the uh, we're basically presenting them to Warp, and Warp chose Kill List. Yeah, fantastic. Um, but I think that was the key to it was that it's not. You know, you've got to have all these. You've got to have all this stuff ready. Yeah. So, you know, if they if I had gone to them and they go, "What do you want to do?" and you just go, "I don't know," and they go, <laughs> but we'll see you in a year. Then when you've sorted your your life out, and then you go back and there's someone else who's new and has just done their film that year, and they everyone's all over them instead. So, they, you know, you definitely have a little. There's a tiny window that you have to you get ready for. Um, and we did the same thing immediately after Kill List. We had projects ready to go yeah. in development, and you know, Sightseers was already lined up. Yeah. Um, and um, and then the other two projects that we're working on at the moment were already written. You know, so it, it was, it, you know, you spend a lot of time sitting about with no work, and you just have to make sure that when you when it starts to go, you're ready. Yeah. Well, it's interesting though with Kill List. I mean, at that stage with Warp. Uh, how defined do you think the story was in terms of how it ended up, or you know, because it's quite uh, bold and unflinching in terms of its psychological content, but also with its violence that is on screen. It so, it, it did really change. So you always had that in mind. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the dark truth of it is that it was. Um, I think was it 2009 Down Terrace came out I wrote the first draft of Kill List in the Christmas holiday of 2009 right which would have been about a week and a half 
Then I took it to Warp and they said yes, and it was greenlit within a month. Then, then Amy and I rewrote it, so that was the second draft. Yeah. And then we rehearsed it, then we rewrote it again after rehearsal, and then we used bits of improvisation on top of it, so it was very quick. But the, the first draft, I think I had to write draft five on it. Wow. I didn't want anyone to know that we'd written it so fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's just amazing, really. I mean, I think to call it a horror is a bit misleading because there's nothing supernatural in there, is there? It's just more psychological thriller type kind of yeah. horrific things happen. Um, so if people are getting a misunderstanding of the genre, did critics really struggle with that genre thing? Or did you find that it was okay? I think it was okay, yeah. I mean, we got amazing reviews for it. We never, I mean, I, I remember going to South by Southwest where we had the premiere of it and I didn't know whether people were just going to hate it. it just, we had no conception of what an audience would, how they'd react to it. Yeah. We just made it in a bubble and made it for ourselves and just, you know, there was no concession to an audience at all. And no, no one ever said, you know, much to the credit of the finances of Film 4 and... Um, and uh, Film Council, I think we were the last one of the last films through the UK Film Council. Yeah, um, yeah. There was never any note saying must calm this down or change it. Mm. In those respects, there was a, there were the, the notes. All the notes we had actually were really helpful and, and um, made the film better. Which is, you know, it always gets my back up when notes turn up, but they were they were really good. Well, I think. Um the development process and development execs can be much maligned, I think, because by and large, they are quite clever people or they're quite passionate about film or even yeah. some, some in TV. Um, and sure, you might get some comments that, through that might not be applicable or unsuitable, but generally, they're always behind the project, aren't they? Or, or the filmmaker. Yeah. I mean, we tried to, we thought that it would be really good to avoid the whole development thing by doing spec scripts finished scripts and rather than going to people and pitching ideas and then getting money off them and then writing scripts and then taking them back again and asking for advice yeah I think that's really you know a really important thing is is to is that too many cooks problem and it dilutes the vision of what you want to do yeah. and really why would you ask advice from other people in a way yeah you you want to kind of have it. You want to know in your own head what you're doing. If you don't know, then there's something wrong, you know. And I've got an, I've got a general thing with notes is if I don't have an answer for it, then I'll have a go at doing the note. But if I've got an answer, I'm not going to do it. Yeah. And and it's like well, there then it's just opinion, isn't it? Well, I'm I'm a big advocate of that kind of approach in terms of taking responsibility for your own work and knowing what it is um, that you want to do and not being insecure or needy because I think some people get the notes back and they go, oh yeah, you're right, oh you're right, you're right, you're right and it's just like, well, you know, as you say, if you, if you don't have that kind of vision or confidence about the story you're trying to tell, I mean, sure, we all, we all know it's difficult to kind of bash out a story and we might not know what we have when we're done but generally to have that uh, assurance or way you want to proceed, I suppose, is, is the important thing to cling on to. Yeah, and I think it's coming through having done Down Terrace as well, so you kind of know that having gone through the whole process of making a film to the end, it, it makes a massive difference. I think when I was in a vacuum and I was just writing, I didn't really have much conception of what it meant to film it. And I think that you see that in a lot of writing where it's kind of, it's about it's very well written, but it's not film. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, and and things that you write on the page, and you know that they'll make a really brilliant sequence, but you know that they read really badly, pretty much. Yeah, and that, that's that's a problem, you know. And it and there is a there's a definite disconnect between those skills, you know, of what what, it, what things look like and how they work visually and with sound and how they how they read on the page, and a lot of readers get very confused by that. Exactly. And, and that's where you get all this kind of pedantic note writing about things not making any sense. I mean, I think things can barely have to make any sense, really, yeah. and um, on, the page, on, on the page, and they'll, and they'll make perfect sense in the cinema because of just the way that um, the, the feelings and the way that actors, um, what, what performances bring to stuff brings sense and the way things are cut. But you don't, you certainly don't have to have 
I mean, in both movies, in Kill List and Down Terrace, we cut all the exposition out, and I hate exposition with yeah. a passion. It's the way to go. I mean, audiences hate it. I mean, audiences yeah. like to interact, don't they? They like to figure stuff out. Yeah, that's it. It's the conversation, isn't it? Yeah. That, and that, and managing the conversation between the audience and, and what's going on is the, is the main skill. I mean, we were thinking, Amy and I were talking about it the other day, and it, it, it's almost like a film is like a memory trick. And what you're trying to do is... You, you're dropping seeds of fake memory into their into the audience's head, so that when they when they when the denouement comes at the end, they feel like they've remembered stuff that makes it all make sense. And those memory tricks are to do with is, are very subtle little things that you drop in, and having and distances between in time over the uh, the length of the, the running time of the movie of when you drop the bit of information and you know how long ago they remember it from all those kinds of things are really important and you kind of don't really I didn't really understand that until I started editing long form and watching mo- watching my own films again and again and again you start to see the structures of them. We get, that's a terrific analogy. I really like that memory tricks. I'm going. I'm going to. I'm going to use that as a quote. <laughs> <laughs> um, and can you tell us the budget of Kill List? Uh, yeah, it was. Um, I think it was seven fifty, but we. I think on screen is about five hundred. Wow. Um, but it's done really well. Obviously, a big hit or a big hit in terms of low budget UK film. Yeah, I mean, um, it made its money back. So yeah. that's. The main thing, and obviously, it has set you up for bigger and better things. So, so what's next for Mr. Wheatley? I'm doing. I'm just editing um, or finishing the post on Sightseers, which is a film that we've done for Big Talk, which is a oh, love com- Big Talk. They're great. Yeah, and that, and that's um, but it's one that we haven't written. Um, so, uh, but Amy did some work on the script. And okay, she's got an additional dialogue credit, and there's a lot of improvisation. So, is that the one with Alice Lowe? Yeah, Alice and Steve Oran. Um, so yeah, we just finished that off, and that's much, it's a kind of um, much lighter, funnier film. And I don't know, I felt a bit guilty of Kill List. It all felt like it was a bit, a bit. You know, you, you look at something like that and go, "Why have you actually done it?" <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, and uh, and so we thought we'd make something that was, which was lighter and funnier and. But it still turned out quite dark. But it's um, um, yeah, we're just finishing that, and then we're on to um, we de- we've got um, a development uh, funds for a film uh, for a sci-fi film, which is much more actiony. Wow! Called Freak Shift, which is a big budget. Thing. And then we're doing um, hopefully next year we're doing a film with Nick Frost um, called I Macrovane, which is one that Amy and I have written, nice. which is. Which is another comedy, but kind of crazy knockabout um, alternate reality sci-fi thing. Okay. Well, to wrap up, then, what would be your kind of key advice to any new writer or new filmmaker who might be listening? Um, well, make your own stuff, yeah. and don't let anybody. Basically, with filmmaking, the whole package is is the art. You see a lot of people on forums moaning about writers moaning about how directors knack their scripts well you know you really need if you want full control of this thing you need to write it and you need to edit yeah. you, need, you need to do the whole package and if you don't do those things then then you're really just another you're another team player mm. in the same way the actors are or the or the cameraman is um, if you want if you want authorship then you have to control the whole the whole game yeah. and that also includes producing you know, you have to be a you have to be a writer, director, producer. If not, then you, you know, then you have to understand where you are in that in that key order of um, of creativity. You know. Yeah. So you know, I think, um, and I think also, if you're a writer and you want to write better stuff, then you need to have directed something. Yeah, yeah, I'm big on that. Yeah, every writer but, should direct. Yeah. Yeah, even if you don't want to. Exactly. But it's just an experience of working with actors and. Seeing how they, you know, how they tick, and the fact that you can write. And the other, the, the, one of the epiphanies I had about it all was that you can write stuff that people can't say, and it's not because it's badly written necessarily, but it's because of the way that the, the, the meter of the people, the the actors can't speak in the way that maybe that you talk. Yeah. Um, and it's not their fault necessarily, but you've got to be 
careful about that and sometimes make, hammering it home and making people um, and demanding that they talk exact, in exactly the same way as you've written things even though you've carefully crafted them may result in um, a perfect rendition of your script and a terrible performance yeah. um, and that kills it even quicker you know than, than a kind of slightly garbled version of the words you know so I, I think that, that that that's something that that's why I've, I use a lot of improvisation just to make sure that the you know, that the emotion gets across as well as the information, you know. Yeah, yeah. Christ, man, this is all top advice. You should do one of your own little guru books of your own now. Oh, and just, God. just on the nuts and bolts and practicalities of everything, that'd be terrific. Um, because it's obviously, you know, you can tell there's a passion and, and kind of knowledge there, which is really great. And thank you so much for giving up your time this morning. No worries, man. It's uh, been, a, uh, been a pleasure. Cool, yeah. And sorry about the internet. Um, Diversion <laughs> uh, interruption. Uh, uh, two weeks of no internet. Don't worry. It's, yeah, it's, it's like, it was like living in the nineties. It was brilliant. <laughs> so what we do is uh, we we play kind of um, clips from the interview on the podcast, and then then I think we make the full interview available on Industrial Scripts website um, because they kind of help the podcast out. Um, and so so there we have it. So thanks again, Ben, and um, maybe see you soon. Cool, man. Thanks a lot. Cheers. Ta-da.